Hi, everybody. It's great to see so many of you here today. Um, I'm going to be presenting about qualitative evidence synthesis in a Campbell context. If you just bear with me for one moment, I will share my screen. My name is Ruth Garside. I'm based at the University of Exeter in the UK. Um, and I'm an associate professor in evidence synthesis with a particular interest in qualitative evidence synthesis and mixed methods. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the Campbell Methods Group. So my plan for today is to give a brief introduction to um, qualitative evidence synthesis, why we do it, um, the stages and some examples of different methods of synthesis for qualitative research. I'm very happy for people to ask questions. So if there's anything that I'm saying that is not clear that you want me to expand on or give more information um, or something is not clear and you want me to clarify the point that I'm making, um, please feel free to use the chat or to raise your hands. Um, uh, Yashika is going to be monitoring the chat and the hands, so I'm very happy for you to interrupt if you want to know um, more about anything that I'm saying. I can see a few people are still arriving, but we're past two, so I think I will just, um, just start. I'm also um, planning to have a short break in the middle of this presentation um, so that you can get a cup of tea or whatever. So we'll start. The first question is what is qualitative evidence synthesis and why do we do it? Why is it important? This is a quote from Bradford Hill who's a renowned epidemiologist, but even as someone who relied on statistics, he said, statistics represent people with the tears wiped off. So the quantitative evidence that we have in systematic reviews is very important for us to be able to answer questions about what works or what the associations or risks are with a particular condition or outcome. But they don't tell us all the things that we want to know. This graph shows um, the survival rates for people with um, brain tumors, a particular sort of brain tumors and particular sorts of treatments. And obviously this information is critical for making decisions, but it doesn't tell us anything about how people experience this condition or the challenges of having this kind of treatment or what it's like to be a carer, for example, for someone who's going through this. And those are also really important questions. So there are key differences in the types of questions that can be answered by quantitative and qualitative evidence syntheses. Trials ask the question, what works? And these are questions best answered by randomized controlled trials often. But we know that randomized controlled trials provide information on the value of an intervention that is shorn of all context, such as people's beliefs and wishes and clinicians' attitudes and beliefs. And despite the fact that these aspects may be crucial to determining the success of an intervention. So that graph that was on the previous slide can't tell us anything about what kind of treatment people want or whether they want to have a particular sort of chemo. And this means that there is often a loss of information in a single study. Qualitative research studies can address important questions such as the feasibility 
appropriateness or meaningfulness of an activity. So as well as what works, decision makers always also want to know other questions. And this list is not exhaustive, but it can show some of the range of questions that qualitative research is able to address. So what are people's experiences or perceptions of these activities or this condition? How can we achieve this change? What do people think about it? Sometimes it can help think about why there is variation by context or experience in intervention effectiveness, or help to identify unintended consequences, which are not necessarily measured in a trial context. Qualitative research can also help to elucidate which factors might help or prevent an activity or an intervention from happening and can also provide information about how different stakeholders value different processes or different outcomes. Another way of thinking about the sorts of questions that a qualitative evidence synthesis might be useful to answer is to think about policy or practice cycles. So this graph shows the stage of the policy cycle in the left-hand column, and then some examples of the sorts of questions that might be useful at this stage of the policy making cycle and which qualitative research might be able to address. So initially, when policymakers are hoping to explore, understand and diagnose the nature of a problem or the scope of a problem or issue, it might be useful to look at relevant stakeholders' views or experiences of that problem or issue. And depending on the question, those might be different sorts of stakeholders, consumers, healthcare providers, social workers, educationalists, and policymakers. Qualitative research might help to understand why a particular problem has arisen or how to understand or frame a problem conceptually. So qualitative research and qualitative evidence <laughs> can help to address those issues um, before the policy um, decisions or before the policy cycle starts. And then there might be the stage of looking at different possible policy options to try and address the issue. At this stage, it can be useful to understand how different stakeholders value different policy options and outcomes and their opinions and views about those different policy options. It can also give you an indication of how acceptable it might be to the population that you're hoping to impact to um, implement this policy and how feasible it might be in the current setup. It can also start to deliver insights into how an intervention might work, and this can be especially useful for complex interventions. Once a policy option has been selected, it can be useful to explore how to bring the policy about, so explore implementation strategies for a particular policy option. So qualitative research and qualitative evidence synthesis can look at the factors which are likely to affect the implementation of a policy, such as the staffing, training, context um, elements that would need to be in place for this to be successful. And it can also elicit the um, views about different implementation strategies uh, to support policy being put into practice. And then finally, once the policy has been um, enacted, it can monitor the, you might want to monitor the effect of a policy option. And that can include questions about the factors which influence how the policy is being implemented, the fidelity, that is whether it's being implemented as um, it was originally designed, um, and also whether or not there are unexpected or adverse consequences. So you can see from these slides that there is a whole range of places where qualitative research might be the most useful way of trying to understand key questions associated with selecting, implementing and evaluating policy or practice. 
So what then is qualitative research? Qualitative research typically explores people's subjective understandings of their everyday lives. And it involves the application of logical, planned and thorough methods of collecting data and careful, thoughtful and above all rigorous analysis. So it's not just doing a few interviews, there's a whole um, set of processes through which qualitative research is planned, um, the way it's conducted and the way it's analysed. And there are some um, key differences between how um, quantitative research and qualitative research is conceived. So um, epistemological and ontological dis um, differences refer to different ways of thinking about what knowledge is, how we acquire knowledge, the limits of knowledge, and the nature of reality, the implications of how we investigate these things. Typically, quantitative research comes from a positivist um, perspective, the idea that there is a single um, truth out there um, which can be discovered. So this is often around producing a hypothesis um, which is going to be tested by the research. Whereas qualitative research tends to have a more interpretative or constructionist approach where we create theory to try and explain how what we're seeing um, can be explained. And these theories or concepts could be tested in the future. Qualitative research tends to use textual data. Um, there are other sorts of qualitative research that looks at images or drawings or even other arts-based activities, but typically it's textual rather than number data. And it's based on the assumption that many of the elements that we want to study are around social events and social truths are constructs that can be multiple. Whereas quantitative research tends to think of truth as being singular, out there somewhere and objective, rather than being created through social and cultural interaction. And one way to think about this is to think about um, a sports game. So say a football game where one sort of information you might want to know about the football game is the score. So say the red team plays the blue team and the red team wins um, that game by three goals to one. That's a single piece of numeric data about the game. But if you want to find out whether or not it was a good game or if the score was fair or the score was a good reflection of how well the teams played or who was the best player, or if the referee made good decisions, you might get different perspectives on that depending on who you talk to. So if you interview people who support the blue team, they may have different opinions to interviewing people who support the red team. If you support, if you were to interview a referee or if you were to interview a professional commentator, again, you'd get different perspectives. And those perspectives are still true, but they're true from the perspective of the person who you were speaking to. So that's the kind of idea behind these multiple social truths coming from different people's perspectives. Um, qualitative research tends to be inductive. So this is often um, data led. Um, and as I said before, you use the analysis of the data to create hypotheses or theories and identify patterns in the data. Whereas quantitative research is more deductive, it's more top down to confirm um, hypotheses or theories out there. So this all um, feeds into the idea around bias or perspective. So quantitative research often sees good research as removing bias, whereas qualitative research often wants to understand the perspective 
from which people are speaking in order to understand phenomenon or topics in their contexts. Um, so partly because of that, quantitative research tends to try and control the settings very closely in order to identify um, the specific impact of an interventional change, whereas qualitative research often wants to think about more naturalistic settings. And finally, um, knowledge is reality versus knowledge is interpretation of the world. Now, this is quite an extreme. Um, in reality, qualitative research often exists on a spectrum between more positivist and more interpretivist ideas about how we know what we know and the best ways of researching that. But generally, um, qualitative research tends to think that the methods that we use for studying, for example, um, biochemical factors might not be appropriate to investigate the experience of complex interventions, the social aspects of encounters um, and other more um, social and person-led ideas. The other aspect of qualitative research is that it often seeks to surface the views of populations that are not necessarily the dominant groups. So it may have an explicit purpose to um, speak to people from, for example, minority ethnic groups or people, um, groups of women or other people whose voices may not be heard in the dominant discourse about a particular topic. Um, so it may have an explicitly sort of political game to give voice to those who might otherwise be more marginalised. So in terms of the implications of this for systematic reviews, on the left hand side of this table shows the typical steps of a systematic review of quantitative research with a pre-specified research question, pre-specified detail of the search, the explicit inclusion and exclusion criteria, pre-specified outcomes, pre-judged quality criteria, um, and approaches which aggregate or pool the information into one finding which increases the precision of a treatment effect. For qualitative um, research and qualitative evidence synthesis, there tends to be more flexibility in all of these steps, which allow um, the approach to be refined as you encounter, encounter the different sorts of data. So there are different sorts of questions. Some are fixed, but some might be more finalized once initial findings from the research have been identified. The search strategy might be refined through the project, either because additional searches are need to, needed to identify important information which was missed in the first um, search, um, or because if you return a lot of information, it's not always easy or desirable to synthesize all the research on a particular topic it can lead to quite thin findings. And so ideas like purposive sampling or um, taking the idea of date, data saturation on board are possible strategies for that. I can just see a couple of questions um, come up in the chat. Um, so somebody has asked, how does one generalize qualitative data outside of its own subjective context? Which is a really good question. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a, in a moment, but just as a, um, an observation, there are a number of ways that you can do this, depending on the sort of synthesis that you do. Um, one is that if you find 
common findings across a range of settings because the papers in your synthesis come from a range of settings or from a range of populations. That can help your confidence that the finding is applicable beyond the original context in which it was found. The other way that you can, um, and we tend to call it, it transfer findings rather than generalized findings. So transferability rather than generalizability. If you're developing concepts or theories which try to explain your findings, often those more conceptual findings can be applicable across settings beyond where the original data was collected. So I hope that um, answers your question. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so yeah, in terms of the other stages of systematic review, inclusion and exclusion might be refined through reading the papers again as the, um, the kinds of papers that you're identifying become clearer in terms of their relevance to your um, question that you're interested in. Um, out, outcomes or more commonly findings of qualitative research are likely to be inductive. So they come from what you identify in the papers that you identify rather than being um, pre-specified. You might have some very general issues that you're interested in at the beginning, like people's experiences of a particular intervention, but the detail of those findings will be developed through the synthesis. And in quality appraisal, although we do have tools to appraise the quality or trustworthiness of qualitative research, which again, I'll talk about a little bit more detail in a moment, but there's also the suggestion that the quality of a particular paper can be judged through the contribution that it makes to the synthesis. So those papers, for example, that are more, um, have more rich data or where the, um, the theoretical frameworks are better developed might have more of an impact on the synthesis than other papers which are relatively thin or quite descriptive. And then in terms of the synthesis, it's more of um, an integration of the findings and the synthesis happens through things like identifying common themes, through translating common um, concepts and also through developing your own concepts and developing theory. Um, so the information is transformed and expanded um, rather than being aggregated. So why do we synthesize qualitative research? There's a number of good reasons for this. Um, and this speaks a little bit to the, um, the question that was in the chat. So certainly, um, when qualitative evidence synthesis was developed, which was in the context of systematic reviews and decision making within the health field, there was um, a certain amount of concern that qualitative research would become more marginalized if, there, if we didn't think about appropriate methods for synthesizing qualitative research in a systematic review context. So there was some strategy in wanting to develop these methods. But beyond that, certainly there's a feeling that it is less wasteful um, because it allows the findings from individual studies to be used within a broader context um, and to be brought together with other research. And through the process of synthesis, that we can try to um, generate more powerful explanations to explain what we're seeing in the data. And this includes the development of broader, more encompassing theories. And as I said, it's the development of these theories that can often enhance the transferability of findings from the specific context in which they were developed to be applicable to a broader range of situations. There's also um, linked to that the belief that these synthesized theories will yield truths that are better or more socially relevant or more complete than you find in individual studies. Um, 
and we know that um, there isn't always a good awareness within qualitative research of previous studies that have addressed similar issues. So the referencing and citation between papers which are actually interested in similar topics is not always very strong. And that's particularly true because qualitative research might be done across a number of different disciplines. So you might have research on a topic which has been considered by scholars in education, but also in sociology, psychology, um, and other issues. So there may not be good communication across those disciplines. So by bringing them together, we hope to develop a more complete picture of the issue under study. Um, and then finally, the um, idea of synthesis for qualitative research is that we will get some kind of conceptual innovation of the parts as a mean of means of creating a whole. And you can see that these ideas around more encompassing theories, um, developing more relevant or more complete truths, or creating conceptual innovation to create a whole are all quite linked um, in terms of the ambitions for qualitative evidence synthesis. So that's some of the backgrounds. Um, when thinking about the um, methods and approaches, the terminology can be quite confusing because there's a lot of different bits of terminology um, which are used to describe qualitative evidence synthesis. Um, so there are a couple of umbrella terms which don't refer to a specific methodology but do um, refer to the sort of field as a whole. So qualitative evidence synthesis is the one that I tend to use, the one that's used in Cochrane at Campbell, but you might also see that referred to as metasynthesis um, as a general approach. And then there are also specific methods which have some overlap, but also have some unique features. And this is not a complete list, but these are some of the more common ones. So metaethnography, meta study, narrative synthesis, realist synthesis, thematic synthesis, meta narrative, critical interpretative synthesis, framework synthesis, and qualitative interpretative meta synthesis are just some of the terms that you might see. In terms of those most commonly seen in the literature, Probably thematic synthesis and framework synthesis are the ones that have got the most um, publications using those methods. Also metaethnography and realist synthesis, which is a way of bringing together both quantitative and qualitative research. Um, but there are certainly you know, more methods emerging all the time. In terms of how you might select a method, it tends to be based on a number of factors. So the experience of the team, um, some of those approaches, for example, meta ethnography uh, requires more um, experience with qualitative analysis than some of the others. The framework synthesis or thematic synthesis are perhaps a bit less demanding of the team. Um, it depends how much time you've got. Again, a framework synthesis can offer a shortcut um, in terms of using an already developed framework for coding and understanding the underlying material. So that can be quicker than trying to do something which is more conceptually innovative like methodography. It, but it also depends on the purpose of the review and the audience purpose. So if um, the audience is interested in understanding the range of ideas that have already been identified in the qualitative research, that might be a framework or thematic synthesis. Whereas if there is a purpose to generate more conceptual understandings or develop theory, um, something like metaethnography or some kinds of thematic synthesis might be better for that. 
And it also depends on the type of evidence which is available. Um, using metaethnography relies on the underlying papers already having quite well developed conceptual and theoretical um, understandings within them. And I'll, again, I've got some examples at the end of this talk, which will show you some of the differences of these different approaches. So um, undertaking a systematic review and qualitative evidence synthesis broadly follows the same kinds of um, steps that you would be familiar with for any systematic review. So formulating the question, searching, screening, data coding and extraction and synthesis. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the first four steps there. Um, and then we'll take a break and I'll talk about um, the synthesis stage afterwards. Are there any further questions in the chat? There's a question. The slides are, will be available and the recording will be available af after this. OK, so moving on, getting the question right. So questions for qualitative evidence synthesis can be standalone questions. So if you're interested in the um, beliefs and experiences of a particular group of people, of having a particular uh, condition or um, whatever, then you could do a standalone qualitative evidence synthesis. But often we find that people are interested in doing a quantitative what works review, but also have some associated questions around, um, for example, the factors that impact on success of implementing an intervention. So it can be part of a mixed methods synthesis. I don't have time today to talk about um, all the different approaches to mixed methods synthesis. Um, that's perhaps a workshop for another day, but uh, just to be aware that there are different ways of using qualitative evidence synthesis and um, they will all, they will, both of those will rely on um, synthesizing the qualitative evidence um, themselves with or without parallel quantitative data as well. So the the questions like, and this isn't unique to qualitative evidence synthesis, the questions you're asking need to be important, perhaps to decision makers or policy makers or um, to a particular field. They need to be questions which are answerable by qualitative research and questions which add to the literature or to the understanding of a the particular strategy gets so long. It's really important that you gather all of the come from well they could be synonyms so alternate uh just for the exact same i'm not concept, sure if this is uh, abbreviations or acronyms so for example attention sorry i wasn't sure if that was a question coming through or if that was some interference <laughs> i'm afraid i muted you erica if you have a question perhaps you could put that in the chat for me or raise your hand. Okay. So, so with um, qualitative evidence synthesis, as I said, there are the poss there is the possibility that the question evolves over time. Um, so questions can be exploratory. So the question acts as a compass to give you an idea of the direction of travel that you want to do, or alternatively questions can be more fixed. So they are more like an anchor um, for the review and more like you would expect them to be in um, an, any other sort of systematic review. But we can 
use structures um, to help define the boundaries of the question. And these can also help inform other stages of the review, such as defining the search terms, developing your eligibility or inclusion exclusion criteria, and perhaps also to think about how you start to structure the synthesis. So I'm just going to show you some examples of frameworks for qualitative evidence synthesis. I expect many of you will be familiar with the PICO framework for reviews of effectiveness. So these are alternative frameworks for reviews of qualitative evidence synthesis. So the first one is a variation on um, PICO. So in this case, the P stands for the population. The I refers to the phenomenon of interest or the topic of interest. And the CO refers to the context. This is quite a broad um, question, and it can work well with those more exploratory questions and also with questions which are standalone qualitative evidence syntheses rather than um, ones that are linked to quantitative systematic reviews. So, oh. <laughs> So the next example of a framework is sometimes called SPIDER. Um, and this looks for uh, the sample, the phenomenon of interest again, the design of the research. So this is, um, for example, are you interested in, in interview studies? Are you interested in the information from open-ended questions in surveys? Are you interested in um, anthropological or observational data? Uh, the evaluation is the type of finding, so that might be around experiences, views, perceptions of the population. And finally, the research type. So are you interested in qualitative research alone or are you interested also in mixed method studies? This SPIDER framework was originally um, developed in the context of supporting searching for qualitative research. Um, and it can also be used for you know, mixed methods type questions. And then finally, um, the other framework you might see um, is SPICE. And this relates to setting, population, intervention, comparison and evaluation. And you can see that this is much closer to a PICO structure. So it thinks about um, in terms of interventions, both of the PICO and the SPIDER, you can ask questions which don't relate to a specific intervention. So if you want to understand what somebody's experience of a particular condition is, for example, um, then you can use those. Whereas the SPICE um, helps you to map on to a, a similar quantitative um, set of papers. So these structures um, cover similar ground. Um, but like I said, the PICO is probably the most flexible. SPIDER also allows you to think about this, to define the types of research that you want to include and might be useful to, insert, um, to inform your searching. And SPICE works well if you are interested in people's experiences of a particular intervention and might help you to map a qualitative evidence synthesis to a quantitative one. So I was going to ask you to have um, a few minutes to yourself to try and use these frameworks to come up with a question relevant to this area of interest. So we at Exeter did a review to try and understand what the potential impacts of robo pets in care homes for people with dementia was. 
And robo pets are, as you may guess, they're kind of robotic animals um, which respond with noises and movements um, to your interaction with them. And they've been promoted as a tool for people with dementia um, to provide companionship and interaction. Um, and these are three examples. So the, this one is, is Paro the seal, which is a baby seal. There are also robotic cats, robotic dogs. So we were interested in robo pets in care homes for people with dementia. And I'm just gonna give you, well, there's so many of you, I don't know if we will manage to get any feedback on this, but I just ask you to think about what the question might look like for a qualitative evidence synthesis interested in robo pets in care homes for people with dementia. If you want to use one of these, just you can just choose one example. If you want to try and design a question, using Pico Spider or Spice, you can put it in the chat and I'll just give you a few minutes to think about robo pets in care homes for people with dementia and see if you can put a question in the chat that relates to that. I'll just give you a few minutes. I can't actually see the chat anymore, Yashika, so perhaps you'll let me know if anyone's put anything in there. I don't know, there's no uh, chat in the chat. No chat in the chat. <laughs> I'll give people a couple more minutes to think about it. Oh, there we go. We just have received a question. It says, what is the impact of uh, robo pets on people with dementia in care homes? Yeah, and I can see another one which says, does the use of robo pets increase the quality of life um, for people with dementia? How do people with dementia perceive the presence of robo pets in their lives? I like that one. I think the first two are quite quantitative and don't necessarily map onto these frameworks. So let's just have a look at a couple of possibilities. So for the PICO, the population, people with dementia, the phenomenon of interest is experience of robo pets and the context is living in care homes. So our question would be, um, Um, how do, what's the experience of robo pets for people with dementia living in care homes? For the spider framework, the sample is people with dementia. Again, the phenomenon of interest, which you can see now inc incorporates both the setting and the pets. Um, the design, including interventions, focus groups and observations. The evaluation experiences, perceptions, views, and attitudes. And we'll look at both qualitative and mixed methods research. So this would be a longer question. What are the experiences, perceptions, views, and attitudes of people with dementia living in care homes of robo pets? But you can see this one has the additional information that might help your search because it defines the kind of research that you would include. And then the final structure, um, the setting is robo pets, the population is people with dementia, the intervention is robo pets, the comparison no robo pets, and the experiences 
um, the evaluation is experienced as or perceived impact. So for the people who put some ideas in the chat, if you were interested in uh, quality of life, you might have that in there. Um, or if you were more interested in, um, I can't remember the question now, I'll have to have a look back. Uh, a couple of people are dropping them in now with using those structures talking about mental well-being, happiness, um, experiences of people with dementia. So you can see that um, compared to some of the questions that I'm getting in the chat, these um, types of structures and the way that qualitative research thinks about these um, questions um, doesn't tend to predefine the sorts of outcomes that you're anticipating. So people have talked about quality of life, mental well-being, um, happiness. Those might be things that come up in the um, in the research that we identify, but we probably wouldn't predefine those because we want to keep it open. So we're allowing the research and the people in the research to define the things that matter to them. So we probably wouldn't predetermine quality of life, mental well-being, happiness, although those things may come up in the research that we find. So these are frames in terms of experience or experience perceptions, views, attitude, experiences, perceived impact. Um, so that's quite helpful, I think, to as a way of thinking about the inductive analysis, so being more data led rather than already theorizing and then testing those theories. OK, so once you've got your question, um, your question obviously can help inform your searching um, because it defines the population group um, and the phenomenon of interest that you're searching for. And my advice um, for searching is to, where possible, consult with a friendly information specialist or librarian to help you with your search. And this is partly because searching for qualitative research can be more complex than searching for reviews of effectiveness. And there are a number of reasons for this. You might find a greater variety of terminology is used around the phenomenon of interest, um, sometimes because it tends to use more lay language than formal language in the way that um, the questions are formulated. So that can make it more complicated to identify relevant studies. Qualitative research is also often poorly indexed um, in databases. So the um, qualitative uh, tag in Medline, for example, is not that old. Um, so if you want to go back in time, it, the studies are not necessarily indexed as being qualitative research. As I said earlier, the research may also be spread across disciplines, so you may need to search more databases in order to make sure that you've identified all the relevant literature for your question, and that um, can take a little bit more planning. Um, and some disciplines don't have the same traditions of writing titles and abstracts to be easily found. They have different motivations, so sometimes the titles and the abstracts are designed to intrigue you or draw you in to want to read the paper rather than being um, a full summary of what the research contains. So sometimes it's difficult even to tell from the title and the abstract whether the paper contains primary research at all. Um, and it's also not always easy to tell if the, um, the topic is of interest to your review. So again, this can make the identifying studies um, more challenging. And that leads on to the next point about non-database approaches. So what are traditionally called supplementary methods like citation chasing, finding sibling studies and expert contact can be really important in um, qualitative evidence syntheses um, because of these other challenges of searching within databases for qualitative research. Um, 
And there are also a number of suggested qualitative research filters, um, more or less sensitive or complicated. And again, it's useful to talk to an information specialist about the appropriateness of these filters for different databases. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not an information specialist, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about searches, but um, just to highlight that there can be some challenges around identifying studies. <clears throat> so once you have identified your studies, um, obviously quality appraisal is still a really important step in um, qualitative evidence syntheses, although there are still some debates involved here, even asking whether or not we should um, do quality appraisal. And there are a number of reasons for that, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then if we do decide to do that, how we should do it, there's a huge number of tools available. I think at the last count, there were more than 100 tools potentially for um, assessing the quality of a piece of qualitative research. There is some work going on at the moment um, with the Cochrane Qualitative Group trying to consolidate um, those tools into, into a single tool. Um, but at the moment, some of the common ones that you might see are CASP, the Joanna Briggs Institute or JBI tool, or the Wallace tool, which is one that I like and I'll show you in a minute. And the other question is about what do we do with the results of quality appraisal? So um, it, in a quantitative review, you might choose to do sensitivity analyses, for example, um, to see what difference it makes to include or exclude poorer quality trials. Um, that's kind of possible in a qualitative synthesis um, approach as well. Um, where you can see whether or not the main findings change um, with um, the inclusion or exclusion of particular studies. I can see a question, I think this is related to the searching, so I will just answer it. There's a question here saying, um, would most qualitative research papers have the term qualitative or something similar in the title or not? Again, it's a really good question and it's quite um, subject specific. So in the health field, it's quite common for the, um, the title to have a qualitative study or qualitative research um, in the title. That's not necessarily true in other disciplines. So sometimes um, it might refer to a particular approach. So it might say something like an interview study, or it might say, um, participant observation study or it might say something about the analysis so for example an IPA an interpretative phenomenological analysis might be in the title rather than qualitative so it may contain either the word qualitative or something more specific but again part of the problem with that is that the number of different approaches to data collection and analysis is quite wide so that's one of the challenges for designing your searches um, and um, sometimes it, it won't have any um, any of those indicators at all in it so it might have something about some of the theory that's being developed or it might have something about um, a quote you know often it's a quote and a, and a high and a colon that makes the title. So it's really mixed. It's certainly you can't rely on it um, as being able to identify all the qualitative research just by using the term qualitative. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. That's really helpful. OK, so just going back to thinking about qualitative um, quality appraisal. There are a number of challenges. Um, one of them is that there isn't necessarily agreement across the qualitative research agreement about uh, qualitative research community about what 
good qualitative research looks like. So few items have been universally accepted as important across all methods of qualitative research and across all disciplines. Um, so that makes it challenging to use um, a specific checklist because you may be assessing research against criteria that the researcher themselves wouldn't recognize as being important to qualitative research. Um, yeah, um, and we, like I said before, there are numerous tools and checklists in existence, and there may be a lack of fit between what qualitative researchers and systematic reviewers agree are important. So often um, systematic reviewers are very interested in process, so they want to know, you know, have you told me how you got your sample, how you recruited people? Have you told me who was in your sample? Have you told me exactly how you did the analysis? Whereas qualitative researchers may be more interested in the quality of the analysis, which is a much more nebulous um, thing to assess. And in my following slide, I'll show you some of the ideas that qualitative researchers have suggested for important elements of quality and qualitative research. And you'll see that it's quite a different way of thinking about it to typical systematic review approaches. Um, number four on my challenge, it's not always clear what we're actually appraising. And this is sometimes to do with the way the tools are constructed, where it's not clear whether it's clear reporting or clear conduct that you're actually interested in. And that's one of the issues I have with CASP, that it's difficult to un unpick that. Uh, number five, there's quite often a degree of interpretation required, even with a checklist. Um, and there was a study done a while back that showed that um, reviewer judgment of how good a qualitative piece of qualitative research was, was only marginally improved um, in their agreement using checklists than not using checklists. And I'm, I think that's probably still the case. I know there's always some interpretation, even in quantitative assessments, but I think it's more so in the qualitative. Um, as I said, there's still not clear um, exactly what we do with poor quality studies. Um, and whether if a poor, what we've judged as a poor quality study identifies similar findings to a high quality study, what, what does it actually mean then that, that, that the study is poor if its findings are resonant with other better quality studies? Does that, is that even really meaningful? Um, and yeah, as I said, there's ongoing work um, that the Cochrane Group are doing to try and consolidate items from checklists. But just to illustrate that issue of the, um, the difference between the way that qualitative researchers might think about validity or quality and typical systematic review considerations. These are some of the um, papers that have tried to talk about um, validity, trustworthiness or um, quality in qualitative research. And you can see that it's quite a different set of concerns to those that you typically see in a checklist for a systematic review. So things like plausibility, credibility, um, uh, the meaning in context, positionality, which is how the researcher puts themselves within the research, um, critical subjectivity and so on. And even here in Smith, moral and ethical component of the research that's being done. I'm not going to read through all of these, but this is really just to illustrate that there perhaps is quite a big gap um, between the ways that qualitative research has thought about itself and the way that systematic reviews try to impose some ideas about quality on them. So, as I said, a couple of the most commonly used ones, the CAST tool, and I really like this one from Wallace. Um, which has a set of um, 12 questions, relatively straightforward, that are answered yes, no, or can't tell. Um, this talk is being um, recorded and the slides can be made available if people are interested in this. Um, but these map quite well um, onto some of the concerns of the other um, reviewers as well. So it's asking you things like, is there a clear question? Is there a theoretical or ideological perspective of the author explicit? And if this influences the study, is the study design appropriate? 
Is the context adequately, adequately described? Is the sample adequate? Is the data collection adequately described? And is it rigorously conducted? Um, are the findings substantiated by the data? Is there consideration to limitations of methods or data? And do any claims of generalizability flow logically from the data? And finally, about ethics. So they're relatively straightforward to answer yes, no, can't tell through. So um, my final um, slide before we take a short break um, is around data extraction and coding. So typically we extract the information about the nature of the paper and the nature of the sample and intervention if, if that's appropriate. So things like bibliographic details, research design and methods, uh, intervention design, if that's part of the study, and sample details, location and context details, you would extract that information out of the um, study. And then we typically code the study findings. Um, so the themes, the constructs, the theories used. Um, and you can either do this by hand, um, coding directly onto the paper, or increasingly, um, people use software that you would use for any qualitative study. So something like um, NVivo or Atlas TI, where you can upload the PDF into the software and then you can code within the software to identify common themes um, and patterns in the data across the different studies. So, I suggest that um, we take 10 minutes break. Does anyone have any questions on what I've delivered so far? Somebody's asked about the, sh the recording and the slides. Those can be made available to you at the end of this. Any questions? Can either put them in the chat or um, put, just ask me actually. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna, oh, hang on, there's a question coming up in the chat. Are we gonna cover coding? Um, in more detail in part two. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to go through coding in this kind of lecture format, um, Adna. So there will be, um, the next section of the presentation is around different approaches to synthesis. So we will be looking at that, um, but it's not a sort of hands-on how to code um, kind of thing. Okay, the next question. Um, in practice, I've found that the authors mentioned in a methodology, it is a qualitative paper and they have conducted interviews and focus group discussions, but when they interpret their results, it's all group descriptive statistics and they calculated mean and standard deviation. Is it actually qualitative? Can we consider those? Yeah, really good question. I um, usually have an inclusion exclusion um, criteria, um, which requires that both the method of data collection and the approach to analysis is, is actually qualitative um, for inclusion in the review. So where people have asked questions, and this sometimes especially happens in questionnaires, um, where there are open questions, but then that data is turned into statistics. And I would not include that um, as a piece of qualitative research. I'd put that in my exclusion criteria. So I'd only include papers where the analysis is qualitative as well as the method of data collection. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, 
and somebody, Kate's asking um, people using NVivo or Atlas TI for data extraction. I'm wondering if anyone uses, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, Taget for qualitative evidence synthesis data extraction. That's a question I think for you lot. I don't have any experience with that, I'm afraid. I don't know, I don't even know what kind of software it is, sorry. Um, but if anyone can tell Kate about their experience of Taget, please do drop that in the chat. Okay, so let's take 10 minutes break and come back at, um, well, my time, it's 3.20, so 20 minutes past the hour. I'm going to put that in the, in here, back at 3.20 p.m. Okay. See you in 10 minutes. Oh, okay. So it's a <laughs> to get the right of it. It's an open source qualitative data analysis package. Yeah, if anyone knows about Taget, please let Kate know and let me know because I'm not familiar with it at all, I'm afraid. Thanks for the clarification, Kate. Okay, I'll see you in 10 minutes.
Okay, so I make it um, I make it 20 past, so I'm going to um, continue with my presentation. I hope you're all back. Alison, I see your question. Um, if you don't mind, I'll deal with that at the end, um, just because of time. Um, but yeah, really interesting question. I'll come back to you. Okay, so. Uh, different approaches to synthesis. So as I said at the beginning, um, there tends to be a, um, a range of approaches from the more deductive and positivist to the more interpretative end. And that's the same for synthesis. So um, some synthesis approaches are more aggregative and pooling of quantitative data would come under this um, heading where you're kind of summing up or aggregating existing themes um, or existing data and it's a more deductive approach so if you do something like a framework synthesis and i'll talk about that a little bit more in, the, in a minute where the concepts are more clearly predefined this can be a more deductive aggregative approach to synthesis the alternative is more interpretative. So this is more arranging, juxtaposing and interpreting existing findings in um, qualitative research to try and offer a meaningful overall picture of what the research is telling us. So this may, rather than test theories, um, may help to try and develop concepts and theories to explain what you're seeing. And it's a more inductive approach of um, analysis, so you're led by the data rather than starting from a particular framework. And methods of synthesis um, sit along this continuum in this diagram. The more configuring approaches are on the left hand side, and these are the ones that generate theory and the interpretation happens during the synthesis to build meaning um, through to the more deductive approaches on the right hand side where interpretation happens largely before the synthesis um, through a more structured framing of the questions and potentially structures to um, explore the findings that are developed before you start. The types of findings that you might get from qualitative research and qualitative evidence synthesis tend to be quite expansive, so it's not like you're trying to find one effect size in a quantitative review, but it might be something like a really rich description of a phenomenon or topic of interest. You might want to develop or define new concepts, create a new typology. Um, one of the very early meta-ethnographies created a typology of different kinds of approaches to medicine taking um, that go beyond the traditional compliant non-compliance and created sort of groupings of patients who behaved in different ways around their, um, their medicine taking. It might be a, a description of a process, so a, um, a client pathway, for example, and the experiences of that. Um, it might develop explanations or theories or develop strategies, so it's a much more sort of expansive list of types of findings. And what this looks like um, includes, and again, this depends on the type of analysis that you're doing, but also on review of preferences, might include, almost always includes text. So quotes from the original participants, quotes from the original researchers' analyses, sometimes tables which illustrate the way the themes have been developed, so themes and sub-themes, different classifications and the papers that um, contribute to those. It might include diagrams or conceptual figures which try and show how the themes are linked to each other to give you one kind of holistic picture of what things look like. And it can also include things like photographs and artwork, images from the research. And it's helpful to think of these um, layers of interpretation, how do we make sense of the world? It comes from the writings of Schultz in, in sociology. So there are first order constructs. So these are our everyday ways of making sense of our world. And we see these in things like participant quotes and descriptive themes. Um, descriptive themes being when the um, researcher organizes the ideas into descriptive themes, but doesn't necessarily add any interpretation to it. 
But then there is the researcher's work, which creates second order constructs. And these are social science researchers' interpretations of this common sense world, which links it to academic concepts and theories. And then on top of that, there might be third order constructs. So these are your interpretations um, of the researcher's interpretations. And some people say, well, third order constructs don't really exist because it's all just researcher interpretation. And I understand that argument, but I think in terms of thinking how we build up um, the coding and the understanding of the data, it's helpful to think of these three steps. So this is an example, um, <clears throat> and this speaks a little bit to the question about the coding, although it's quite brief, but this is taken from a synthesis around preventing cardiovascular disease. Um, and these are two quotes from participants in two different papers, so paper A and paper B. The first quote, pamphlets involve a lot of reading, um, food sampling, which was part of the intervention, uh, gives them the opportunity to feel relaxed and ask questions. And the second quote from a second paper is, Sue was great, Sue's the name of a, a health advisor. She had lots of information and lots of advice. So these are first order constructs. This is what the participants in these two different studies said. And the researcher interpretations in these two um, different papers were in the first one, practical demonstrations have more impact than the provision of written information. And the second quote with Sue having lots of information and advice, the researchers said program champions allow personalized information about the interventions to be disseminated. So that was what the researchers interpreted from the original data. And as reviewers, we thought, well, actually these, um, Two examples, food sampling and the program champions, are actually functioning in a similar way. And we joined them together into our own theme. So we coded these separately to say that um, interventions that allowed personalized support, whether that was through food sampling that allowed people to feel relaxed and ask questions, or this program champion who had information and advice. This was all really about personalized support and allowing relationships to develop, which facilitated questioning and might have more impact. So you can see how we built up from the um, first and second order constructs in these two original papers. And we coded these initially um, as being about different sorts of activities, but eventually we combined these into a single concept, which was around personalized support and developing relationships. And that's the way that we built up across the different papers. And you can see there as well, how this might allow, in answer to that other question about how we can apply findings to more contexts, because we sort of lifted this up a level and said it wasn't necessarily about the specific nature of that personalized support, it could be food sampling, a champion or some other structure, that the important function of that was around developing relationships, allowing questioning and developing personalized support for people. And so that kind of finding can potentially apply across a number of different settings and encompass different specifics of the intervention. So we've only got about half an hour left. So I've got three quick examples of different approaches to synthesis. Um, to give you an indication of the way in which these work and the sorts of outputs that they um, produce. So the first one is a framework synthesis. And this is taken from quite an old paper now that I was involved in. This was actually one of my very early qualitative evidence syntheses. Um, it was a, a policy question and it was asking us to um, look at what factors influence the uptake of information to prevent skin cancer. Um, so the aim was to understand the elements that contribute to successful or unsuccessful conveyance of skin cancer prevention messages and their uptake by the public. That's what we were asked to find out. And we identified a number of different papers that looked at people's experiences of, um, and beliefs around preventing skin um, cancer. And we realized that I think it was um, four out of about nine papers used the health belief model as a way of structuring 
their understanding um, of the findings. So we decided to adopt the health belief model as a framework for our analysis. So we looked through all the papers in our synthesis and we coded against these key concepts. So the perceived um, susceptibility, um, how people rated their chances of getting skin cancer, the perceived severity of skin cancer, perceived benefits of taking action. So wearing suntan cream, staying out of the sun, wearing hats and, and long sleeves and so on. The barriers to doing that, um, cues to action. So things that encourage them to take action and their confidence in their ability to perform those actions of, of covering up and protecting themselves. And through underneath those um, six health belief model frames, we developed a number of underlying contributing themes. So in many cases, they, there weren't um, very many other contributing themes, but particularly around barriers and cues to action, we grouped the findings that we identified in the studies in relation to positive perceptions of a TAN, and that was further broken down into these sub themes you can see in the right hand side, the hassle or the trouble of taking protection. Again, that was related to different activities, structural challenges to um, taking action, a particular group of findings which were around adult responsibilities and, and preventing children from getting sunburned. Um, and ideas around being outside and incidental tanning. And there were also a number of cues to action that we broke down into contributing themes. So these included knowing people with skin cancer, media awareness campaigns, and sources of encouragement. So you can see how we built on the original framework and developed a number of underlying themes for each of those key elements in the belief model, which we found in the papers around preventing skin cancer. And then within, e for each of these themes and sub-themes, we would write up a sh short section like this, um, which showed which papers contributed it to these ideas. Um, so three case study reports report negative association with white and tan skin. You can tell this is a very European set of papers. Um, so very pale people were described as looking like a milk bottle, like a ghost, being a couch potato. And then we say which papers those were found in. White skin invoked negative emotions with people feeling embarrassed and self-conscious of very pale skin, especially if British are on holiday somewhere. Um, so this is a quote from one paper from Scotland. When the white legs come out, I'm ashamed to be Scottish. It's like if you see a group of Peely Wally people, then they are Scottish. And Peely Wally is a dialect Scots term for um, being a bit wee weak, I guess. And um, yeah, unpleasant. And then the Australian study also found a similar negative association of pale skin with being British. So that we develop these themes and in the paper for each of those sub themes, we write up um, the evidence that we found in the papers across all the papers that contribute to that theme. So that's a very quick whistle top shore. I can see there's some comments in the, yeah. Somebody's also said, you can tell these were done in Western countries. Yeah, we were asked to do that. Our, um, our policy question came from NICE in the UK, so they were particularly interested in studies that were relevant to the UK setting, but you're absolutely right, if they were done in a different setting, you'd have found a completely different set of meanings around tan skin and pale skin, absolutely. Um, uh, let me see. Okay, so... I don't think there are any direct questions there. So um, thematic synthesis. So again, this is one of the very common approaches to synthesis that you're likely to see. And the example that I'm showing you here is based on our um, review around robo pets and the impact of health and well-being on residents and care homes. 
our questions, you can see question A is our qualitative question. So it's quite open. What are the experiences, views and perceptions of residents, families and carers and care home staff of interacting with robo pets in the older adult residential care setting? And then the quantitative question asks about the measured effects on health and well-being. So um, just to show you the scale of the work that we did, we had an overarching synthesis of quant and qual work, and that included 10 qualitative studies and seven randomized controlled trials, and then two mixed method studies, which appeared in both parts. But what we um, did was to develop a conceptual model from our thematic synthesis. Um, each of these circles represents a theme. So we have themes about the robo pet, about the resident, about resident quality of life and person to person interaction. And within each of those, we had sub themes. So the robo pet, um, there were themes around the responsiveness of the robo pet, entertainment or stimulation value of the robo pet, something to care for, affection, companionship and emotional bonding and examples of residents confiding or taking the opportunity to communicate with the robo pet. So this is a similar um, example in a way to the framework synthesis but the so where you've got themes and sub themes but we've both we've presented it differently we've tried to show how they relate to each other um, and we've presented it not just in a table where each of those things are separate, but as a, as a sort of coherent whole. And again, within each of these um, examples, there's an accompanying text. So in terms of the resident experience, one of the things that the um, residents spoke about was how the, <laughs> Apologies for my cat. This is Vincent who likes to get involved. Um, so for the residents, he's not a robot. He's a real pet. <laughs> um, one of the things that residents talk about was how they reminisced about their own prior experience of pet ownership when they engaged with the, um, with the robot pet. And so again, within each of these themes and sub themes, there'd be a paragraph which incorporates quotes from um, and observations from the papers. So in this case, five studies of the 10 noted that robo pets appear to awaken memories which increase communication with care staff and family members. And then the references of the studies that found that. Um, in some cases, the robo pet could facilitate more focused memories of specific activities or time spent with animals or pets. Um, so participant J could not visualize Cuddler, which is a robo pet dog. Um, the texture and fur reminded her of um, her recently deceased dog and invoked fond memories of the animal that she missed holding and touching. So for each of these um, sub themes, we would identify some text around that. And then the other thing that we did and this is the only bit that I'm very briefly talking about mixed method synthesis, the quantitative study, we were able to do some meta analyses on some of these outcomes. So, for example, um, two studies found um, measured agitation in the care home residents and the meta analysis found a small but positive impact on reducing um, agitation. And so what we tried to do with this um, diagram was to show with these yellow circles where the quantitative research also spoke to these similar themes. So this diagram as an output from the um, qualitative evidence synthesis became a tool to synthesize the quantitative and the qualitative together by highlighting where there were um, findings relevant to the outcomes. So you can see that there is some overlap, but that also the qualitative evidence synthesis talks to quite a lot of other 
additional bits of information, um, including challenges about adopting robo pets in the care home. And also we, because we looked at um, different stakeholders, so staff and family um, also had, were included in the qualitative evidence synthesis. So we were able to give a sort of bigger picture. Okay, and then finally, meta-ethnography. So meta-ethnography is one of the older approaches. It's also one of the more sort of theoretical approaches, one that uses that kind of configuring interpretative approach. And this is taken from a review that we did about ADHD prevention in schools. Um, and this paper, called ADHD, Parent Perspectives and Parent-Teacher Relationships Grounds for Conflict. Um, and we included six studies here, and the findings suggested that high quality teacher-patient relationship, uh, parent-teacher relationships, excuse me, um, were found to unfortunately be the exception with mothers in particular often feeling silenced and criticized by the um, staff in schools. Uh, the findings showed commonalities with wider research about parents, but identified these grounds for conflict resulting from parental blame for parent uh, pupils' disruptive behavior and ambivalence in the nature of the concept of ADHD uh, between both um, parents and, and teachers. And again, this was part of a much bigger um, review, but I'll just talk about this bit. So it was it was part of a series of reviews that actually included two quantitative and two qualitative evidence syntheses, which we tried to bring together in this one massive um, report. But um, like I said, we're just um, talking about this one bit of paper, which looked at the question, what are the school related experiences and perceptions of parents of pupils diagnosed with ADHD? Um, so this shows first and second order concepts from the studies. So in order to develop these, we translated key findings across the different papers to identify those common conceptual areas that were identified within the papers and spoke across the series of papers that we included. And you can see that these concepts are a little bit more, um, they're not as descriptive as the previous um, themes that we were looking at. They are more conceptual findings. So there was the idea of um, teachers as professionals um, in conflict with what were perceived as amateur parents. And so teachers felt comfortable criticizing parental skills. There was a cultural dissonance between what people said and what they experienced. A concept called weapons of the weak, um, refuting criticism. So this was about parents who felt very diminished by the school's um, attitudes towards them. And so they were coming from a position of weakness and tried to refute the criticism that the um, teachers were putting on them. They also, the parents felt silenced um, and there was a clash of expectations between parents and teachers. There was also a theme around parents' perceptions that schools were the sites um, of the origins of ADHD so that the children responded to the structural constraints of schools in a way that um, exacerbated their ADHD. And then, we created this line of argument where the overarching theme was that mothers felt silenced. And this was because they had dashed expectations. What they expected the schools to do to support them did not come to fruition. And it resulted in them feeling very unable to express their um, needs and to work together with the um, teachers to try and address the problems their children were having. We also identified that the conflict between parents and teachers was the norm and that it seemed to be exceptional that that wasn't the case. And that brought together ideas from across um, four of these main themes. And finally, a smaller theme of resistance. So parents tried to resist 
um, the criticisms of the schools that they experienced. And this was building on that idea of the of the weapons of the week that um, parents felt very disempowered. So the only thing they felt able to do was to try to resist what the teachers were saying to them. So you can see that these are um, quite more theoretical ideas um, and that these these ideas that the reviewers developed are more um, abstract, if you like, than the descriptive findings of the examples that came before. And again, I mean, in all cases, there's some write up of what's going on. So this idea of dashed expectations, um, obviously it's much longer in the paper, but just as an example of how we talked about it, um, this sub theme established the nature of expectations that mothers from included studies expressed for their children's education and how the breach of these expectations led to escalating attempts to intervene in the way that their children were being educated. The expectations of parents involved the well-being, education and socialization of their individual child, and they expected their child to be reasonably happy at school. Several mothers cited their child's unhappiness as a primary reason they attempted to intervene in the school. This is a quote from a mother. He was very pale. He was very, he was more emotional. He was starting to pull his eyelashes. He developed a tick and I thought he's obviously stressed. He's more stressed than he should be. And he was saying, I'd rather be dead than go to school. So these expectations that parents had about how their children would be um, managed in the education system was frequently dashed or, or um, you know, um, I can't think of a synonym. My brain's starting to go a little bit. Um, their expectations weren't met um, at all. So that's all I have in my presentation. Just a quick word about the various organisations that are involved in qualitative evidence synthesis. So Campbell is um, accepting qualitative and mixed methods systematic reviews um, and Cochrane are quite well established in doing that. Um, both are now accepting standalone qualitative evidence syntheses, although it's still more common, particularly in Cochrane, to have um, mixed methods um, syntheses. And we're currently um, developing a handbook around um, qualitative evidence synthesis methods. The other organisation people may be aware of is the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence, um, which, like Campbell and um, Cochrane promotes systematic review methods, but are interested in um, environmental management um, reviews. And again, there aren't any examples at the moment, but we are working to get some um, guidance out um, for qualitative evidence synthesis in that field as well. And the other group that I haven't talked about, but who are interesting are the Grade Circle group who have developed a series of tools um, for grading the confidence that we can have in synthesized findings out of qualitative evidence syntheses. Um, so look them up. Until the handbook is um, published, there are a series of papers which are um, referenced on the qualitative and implementation methods group page. They were published in the, bizarrely, they're published in the um, Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, but they're very qualitative and they are a very useful source of information about how to approach a qualitative evidence synthesis. Um, so that's a good source of information as well. So that's all I have to say. We've got about 10 minutes um, for questions. Um, there's my, my Twitter feed is on um, the slide as well as my email address um, if people are interested and we're, the recording and the slides will be available after this presentation. So I'm just going to have a quick, <laughs> thank you for the love for Vincent, um, I'm just going to have a quick look in the, um, in the chat. If you do have any questions for me, feel free to raise your hand or drop it in the chat. I'm just going to pick up Alison Riddle's question. Um, so Alison says she's doing a mixed methods review, an effective, effectiveness review and a qualitative evidence synthesis, um, looking at 
context and implementation factors and how these influence um, intervention effectiveness, which is a very common um, use um, of qualitative evidence synthesis. But she says, um, in the discussion sections of quantitative studies, authors often share their views on the influence of context and implementation factors. Is that considered qualitative data? Um, she's interested in the views of researchers as well as the beneficiaries of the interventions. This is a really interesting question, Alison, and I think my perspective on it is perhaps more purist than some, other, some of my colleagues. So from my perspective, that is qualitative data, but it's not a qualitative finding because it's, it hasn't been analysed by a researcher. You know, when you've got a piece of qualitative research, it contains those first and second order constructs, what the people say and the interpretations that have been put on that by the researcher. So my opinion on this is that those discussion sections are the equivalent of an individual participant interview script. So you've got a researcher's interpretation or a group of researchers interpretation written down but you have that hasn't been analyzed by a researcher. So my view on this stuff is that you should analyze across all the discussion sections, identify common themes, and then you've got a set of qualitative findings that could be incorporated into your qualitative evidence synthesis. But I know that not all my colleagues agree and have treated that kind of evidence used it in qualitative evidence syntheses. I think there are specific ways where that's done really successfully. So for example, when you use formal methods of um, QCA, so qualitative comparative analysis, where you might use bits of information about the nature of the intervention, about the nature of the researcher perspectives, um, and other types of information within that QCA, um, so yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I think I'm quite purist about it. And I tend to think that that needs analyzing before you put it into a synthesis, if you see what I mean, because it's not the same, doesn't have the same status of evidence as qualitative research reports have, where the data has been collected and analyzed in particular ways. But I don't think that's the only approach. Does that help? Yeah, it really does. It helps to clarify how I was struggling with it. You've, you've mm -hmm. articulated it well, thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, I can see a couple of hands. Natalie, do you want to ask your question? Yes, um, thank you for the presentation. I found it very clear and um, Great. everything was, um, and I couldn't understand everything. Sometimes, I mean, often, always, I would say, when I try to code, um, you know, participants' quotes and researchers' interpretations, you know, the first and second level construct, mm -hmm. would I find that I don't agree with their interpretations? I, I understand because they probably had word limits and they, they could only choose one quote. But even in your example, I didn't see the personalized kind of care in the quotes which were there. Yeah. And the author's interpretations. How do you deal with this kind of conflict? Do you trust the researchers or should I trust the participants? I, I always feel very kind of ambiguous about that. Yeah. I mean, I think... Um... It's a really interesting question. And I think it's one of the reasons why I like metaethnography because it doesn't sort of contain that conflict because you are, metaethnography works with existing interpretations and not the, the direct quotes. And I think one of the things to remember is that um, you're only seeing part of the evidence that they have seen to support their finding. So I understand your perspective on that table that I showed about the, the overarching 
theme, partly because I only had space for two examples on the slide. There were more studies that actually underlied that third order construct, but I just included two for simplicity. And I think sometimes some of that happens in the primary research write-ups, that there's more data behind it and they've selected a quote that perhaps doesn't resonate as well as some other quote might have done. Um, some of this question gets answered in the quality appraisal. So in that Wallace criteria that I showed, one of the questions is about how well the findings or conclusions of the researchers are supported by the underlying data. So the, can you see that link between the primary, between the first order and the second order constructs? So some of that gets incorporated through your quality appraisal about whether you find that paper as a whole trustworthy or not. And you might then want to make some decisions about how much you rely on the findings of that study. Um, I think it's a really difficult issue. I don't think there's one answer um, because in many ways, I don't think you should be trying to reanalyze the primary data because you've got such a small snapshot of the data that they've built their write up on. Um, and there may be examples you're not privy to that actually do support their, their interpretation. Um, but I also know that I've done work where I've used quotes for a different part of my synthesis to the bit that they've been used um, in, in, in the primary research. So I think it's a real juggling act and it's a, it's a really good question. I think it also illustrates that, um, how important the researcher is in qualitative analysis, whether you're a reviewer or a primary researcher in generating the findings, you know, we are the research tool and our, our, the robustness of our, um, analysis is only as good as we are in many cases. So yeah, I think I, it's a really good question. I think it is really challenging. I don't think there's a single answer to that. I hope that helps. I don't feel like I've answered it. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. So the key message I got from you is don't reanalyze. <laughs> I think so. I do not have all the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you don't have access to everything that they have access to. Yeah. And maybe they've just made a poor selection of the quote that they've used to illustrate their point, but you don't know what else they have underlying it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then another hand I can see, I'm not sure if you are Jiri or Cantor, apologies. Uh, yep, yeah. hello. Hi. Can you, can you hear me? Hi, uh, yeah, Jiri is my first name. Hi, Jiri. Uh, hi, I, I had a question that I wrote into the chat, but I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that uh, you spoke about this, and it was connected to the demographic factors. Uh, this is something what we really struggle very often in the area of education if we prepare protocols for system, qualitative systematic reviews that um, we um, actually miss data to compare various um, educational system across countries. And uh, every time we have a, a long discussion, how to limit the demographic factors, of, for example, countries, uh, and uh, how to make it sense, because uh, usually it's, uh, I also noticed that uh, in many other colleagues, it's uh, rather done by chance uh, than by, that it's not based on some like hard data that we can really assume that there will be a difference in the in the results. So I wanted to ask about uh, your experience with this or some recommendations how to deal with this issue. Thank you. So I'm not sure I fully understand your question, Jiri, I'm sorry. So you're asking about um, how you gain more understanding of the context of the studies if it's not written into the paper, is that right? No. It's, it's rather connected to reachability criteria. For example, we have uh, just now we had a project focused on uh, parents' experiences with in inclusive education. And our question was, uh, shall we include all the countries or for example, or only Europe 
European countries okay. are, were, were, is there any difference or not? And we yeah. couldn't find any data to support our ideas. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think there's not good guidance about that, about how, you know, whether whatever your topic is, whether it's about school systems or it's about um, healthcare systems, social care systems, to what extent is it sensible to combine um, findings from across studies, whether or not there's enough similarity in the population or the way in which the um, education, health or social care is organized for it to make sense. And I think that is a decision that's generally made by the review team on a case by case basis. And sometimes it's in, incorporated um, you know, if you've got a policy customer, then they may say they're only interested in European contexts or sometimes we get English speaking contexts, which I'm never really sure about how sensible it is to combine across UK, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, you know, really vastly different um, environments. But we're often asked to combine studies across those sorts of studies. So I I don't know of any good guidance. I think it is done on a case by case basis and it depends on the, the question you're asking, who the policy customer is, if there is one, and the specificity of the sorts of questions that you're asking. I mean, again, sometimes I'm based in the UK. So sometimes we have people who are very interested in the specific NHS context so our health service context because it's very specific um so yeah i i don't think there is very good guidance about that kind of incorporate you know incorporating evidence from a, a wide variety of, of countries you know on the other extent extent we have who questions where they want a global perspective um where again you may have vastly different kinds of systems that you're looking at but it's something that I think you can also try and maintain awareness of within the analysis within the synthesis if you're seeing groups of studies with similar findings and groups with conflicting findings if you like that is something that you can try and do th through the synthesis as well as before sorry I can't offer more directive guidance on that Thank you very much. This is very helpful. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can see a question in the um, in the chat about reporting on frequencies of themes. Half the time I see this and half the time I don't in qualitative research. Um, that's that's a really good question. I. I tend not to report frequencies because it doesn't feel like a qualitative method. And I think it depends why you're doing it. Um, so sometimes people want to report which studies report a particular theme. And I think that is important because it helps you to create an audit trail of which studies inform which particular set of findings. So I think that's important. But I don't find percentages helpful because I, you know, it's qualitative research. You're not talking about a representative sample where you are trying to make estimates to a population level from what you're looking at. If what you're trying to do by reporting on frequencies is something about the confidence that you have in the findings. I really recommend you have a look at the CERQUAL information because the number of studies is only one part of what makes the underlying um, or makes the finding more or less, you know, one that you can have more or less confidence in. So um, the uh, CERQUAL framework asks you to look at methodological limitations of the underlying studies the relevance of the underlying studies, the coherence of the findings in the underlying studies, as well as the adequacy of the amount of data. And so rather than, than relying on that very quantitative idea of the number of studies, you're actually looking at a more nuanced set of criteria for the studies that underlie 
the finding that you're looking at. So CERCPOL has tried to sort of move that debate on a bit by thinking about those different qualities of the underlying studies that inform a particular finding. Okay, I can see also a question. I think this is Amelia. What if there are no participant quotes? Often in evaluation, no quotes are included. I'm about to embark on a synthesis of evaluation exercise. Curious to see how this will work. Oh, I think she's gone, but I will answer this anyway. Shame that I've missed her. Um, yeah, it's really frustrating when you don't have quotes because you have no, again, you have no audit trail then. You don't know what people have actually said. And you can't make that judgment that Natalie was asking about earlier about are the researchers findings well supported by the underlying data, you can't make that judgment, which is really difficult. Um, you also sometimes find that in mixed methods reports where the qualitative portion of the mixed method study can be given a really small part of the paper write up and you don't get any quotes. Um, again, I mean, we have sometimes not included those papers to say, you know, we can't make any judgments on how well they have um, interpreted the underlying data because there's no way of us looking at any quotes and feeling confident that they have made appropriate um, analytic decisions. Um, you would also have to mark, if you did include them, you'd have to mark them down on the quality appraisal because one of the questions is about how well the um, researchers themes are supported by the data. Um, so that's another, another aspect, but yeah, I think it's a real challenge and it can be quite frustrating. Okay, I see that we are over time. So thank you very much um, for being here. It was lovely to see so many of you. Thanks for your questions. Um, and yeah, I really hope it's been useful.